assistant professor indian institute of tourism and travel management gwalior an enthusiastic photographer an active writer and temple architect in social media platforms and an icon iconographer sir is working for the reclaim temples movement and specialized in heritage interpretation mr ramakrishna has traveled extensively in india and trained the two guides across the country one of the content writers for iittfc online course by ministry of tourism government of india sir is also a member of parliament committee of arts for central vista and selected indian knowledge systems mentor of ministry of education government of india under new education policy 2020 sir we are to welcome you for the one day national level webinar and i request you to take over this session sir over to you thank you professor thank you so much for that kind uh, introduction uh, with the permission of uh, lalita thomas madam anila thomas madam prakash sir and all other faculties of the department namaste from iittm and namaste from uh, ramakrishna also so uh, before starting the session uh, i would like to share my screen and uh, because uh, this session is for 2 hours 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock and uh, what i have to do is i have to squeeze the 7000 years of historical timeline of uh, indian art and architecture to 2 hours uh, so basically whenever i go to uh, classes ba basically i do more of workshops rather than lectures because uh, uh, the lectures i deal with have got lot of terminology uh, to remember and uh, to understand so i always go to class with a handout i distribute the handouts and then i make students to write remember because each and everything is interrelated if i am teaching you some art and architecture from indus valley civilization you can never uh, uh, think that it is only limited to indus valley civilization it is as relevant as then as today also so it is linked so please while the session is going on uh, i know uh, due to the limitations we cannot keep it more interactive but i understand uh, whenever you have doubt wherever you wanted to ask some questions you please drop in the chat box at the same moment uh, so that uh, okay in the last uh, some 20 25 minutes we will try to uh, answer those questions and uh, basically it will be almost like i'll share the ppt i have got lot of photographs Uh, as prakash has introduced me i am a photographer so i keep traveling across the country and i keep clicking the photos of the heritage buildings and monuments and i keep interpreting it so let me tell you uh, before starting the session one important thing is uh, india is a country now with more than or roughly 40 unesco world heritage sites and the top country or the first country the country that ranks first in terms of unesco world heritage sites has got somewhere around 56 or 57 unesco world heritage sites so there is a difference of just 15 numbers so the top countries like germany italy spain france china and then comes india so india ranks the top 5 or 6 among the top 5 or 6 countries in the world in terms of unesco world heritage sites when even after neglecting for example many of you are from the south so you must be aware of uh, the legacy of the hoysala architecture and still hoysala architectural buildings are not into the unesco world heritage sites and whenever unesco gives the heritage sites status to indian buildings monuments they group them for example the hill forts of rajasthan the five forts of rajasthan the massive and grand forts of rajasthan are clubbed together and are called one single uh, element or one single monument even then we are at 40 and uh, for example from tamil nadu uh, the living chola temples all the chola temples are clubbed together and called as one single entity 
and despite of such numbering also we are one of the top 5 countries in the world in terms of unesco world heritage sites imagine if they are individually numbered we would be we would be far ahead of rest of the countries in terms of heritage and that is the scope we have in india when when we do not have any idea of what this heritage heritage buildings stands for because even today we have not started heritage and heritage interpretation aspect in india till now we whenever we talk about tourism we just visit the monuments but we never try to understand what do they mean what do they want to convey us what message our ancestors have uh, coded into the buildings to convey us something that has never been done so i say to you all that in the future if you have little interest please pick up heritage and heritage tourism and start working on heritage monuments you have got great scope and it is still less explored i will give you one example in the year 2019 niti aayog has come up with a report heritage management in india after seven decades after 70 years the national think tank has realized that there is need for us to understand how important heritage is for india and how much it is existing in the open grounds and we are not able to understand and we are not able to appreciate it and that is the reason the niti ayog's report reiterates again and again saying that the future is going to be bright for the people who are into heritage and heritage tourism so with this uh, a small introduction i would like to uh, i share my screen and uh, i show you the photographs and quickly run you through the 7000 7000 years of uh, uh, history or timeline wherein i'll be talking about a lot of terminologies i will scribble you please keep observing very uh, uh, closely and whenever uh, you feel like whenever you have some doubt you please drop the chat box i will answer them in, at the end of the session so let me share my screen yeah so if one of you can please say me that my screen is visible my ppt especially yes sir so it's visible right it is visible no uh anyone of is it visible sir okay thank you thank you so much so for next one and a half two hours we'll be talking about uh, the legacy of indian art and architecture uh so before getting into the discussion let me tell you uh, indian architecture or indian art and architecture can be classified like this okay generally in this lecture also i'll be going like this indus valley civilization vedic era buddhist art and architecture jain hindu indo islamic indo european or basically we can call it as colonial architecture also so now we will have a quick glimpse at the art and architecture of indus valley a civilization these are two sites indus valley sites from uh, gujarat and this first one is lothal and uh, the second one is dholavira so when you were studying about or if you have listened to the classes or during the history classes or art and architecture cultural uh, uh, syllabus or cultural subject classes you must have come across the explanation saying that uh, how uh, indus valley civilization people have used bricks especially the sun dried bricks and the baked bricks enormously uh, to construct their cities homes ports palaces etc but then i would like to bring your notice uh, bring it to your notice here is along with the brick they have also predominantly used stone in the construction and this is one element that is always kept away uh, from history books for many other reasons and untold reasons but the fact is if you go to dholavira and if you observe the indus valley site whole construction whole okay site is filled with the stone bricks or the stone elements you can also see 
here in this veranda you can also see a beautifully carved stone pillar base so i'm talking about 5000 years ago before christ or before common era and this is the time when there were four civilizations like yellow river civilization mesopotamian civilization indus valley civilization and egyptian civilization and all these four civilizations when you mark on the world map it comes like a crescent or it comes like a cradle and that is the reason four civilizations put together are called as cradle of civilizations and of that one of the oldest is indus valley civilization and we were using the technique of baking the bricks and imagine right from the time of indus valley civilization till now there is no change in the advancement or technology of baking the bricks and using the bricks for construction it is the same the making of the bricks the arrangement of the bricks using the cementing material and the purpose they are used for have not changed at all along with baking they also have used sun dried bricks equally and then i repeat they also have used stone so remember whenever we talk about indus valley civilization the construction especially the architecture part architectural part did not happen only with the bricks it also happened with the stones and especially the carved stones they have sculpted the stones that is one important aspect we have to remember and then like what are all the different purposes they have used bricks for uh, construction see uh, the one picture the picture that you are seeing here is uh, the drainage the drainage system of uh, the lothal here they have connect, uh, constructed big canals through this the water used to flow and imagine even if you go to villages today and look at the sewage system it is this is how exactly they are built there is no change and you also have sinkholes at certain intervals and when they are filled the municipal corporation or local gram panchayat comes removes the dirt from the sinkholes dry them so this is how exactly happened 5000 years ago 7000 years ago or 5000 years before common era in indus valley civilization and nothing has changed till today it is same the only thing that has changed in this 7000 years is the ratio of the brick that was 4 is to 2 is to 1 during indus valley civilization has changed to a different ratio today that is the only thing going further see i said you the indus valley people have also used stone predominantly and especially the sandstone from the region and what did they do they have sculpted the sandstone and they have made the pillars of their houses with the stone sandstone and why am i bringing this discussion of stone again and again to the uh, forefront in this lecture is because the further concept that we talk about are all related to the stone for example let me tell you the ashokan art ashokan pillars why are they famous they are very famous for their mirror finish and when was ashoka there 100 okay 180 252 180 before common era right and during the same time imagine at least okay some 4500 years before ashoka indus valley people were carving the stones and can you see the finish even this stone is also the mirror finish stone due to time that is lost otherwise you can see that softness and that is the reason i am always okay trying to bring this discussion or this concept to the forefront now going further indus valley people were pioneers of their city planning always their city was in the oriented in the east west direction their homes always faced east and west side of the town was having little okay a higher elevation and east side little lower so that whenever there is rain the water can drain out very easily the lower town of indus valley was big and having many homes 
and in the upper town was a smaller having less homes the bigger homes and most probably people estimate that this to be the residence of royal families or generally people call it citadel in our historical language and you can see here an artistic imagination of indus valley as town or street and the homes how they are you can see yes it is true that okay there were uh, double storied buildings in indus valley there were staircases to access, access the first floor people used to sleep on that and they used to dry their grains on the top of their roofs it is equally exactly done even today also in the rural areas and here you can see okay the beauty is just have a look at it there is a well and this is the end of the home and this must be another street so people whoever are passing by they had a small entrance here and they used to access the water water was given lot of importance water harvesting system proper drainage system sewage system taming the rivers building artificial ports so that they can connect to the rivers and then to the sea and from sea they can trade with bahrain oman mesopotamia egypt and that is how we found the seals of indus valley as far as mesopotamia so by looking at this you must understand how indus advanced indus valley civilization people were and how their homes were advanced how they have used i repeat how they have used wood brick two types of bricks sun dried baked bricks and the stone to construct their houses so always from our books and the classroom teaching the component of stone is always missing which i want i am highlighting here in this lecture right and these are uh, the washrooms you can see the commodes and also the lota here and then this is the picture again from uh, the lotal only uh, this is a bathing room or bathing area and what is the speciality or, or how is it uh, surprising is because you must have seen the hand pumps in the villages today isn't it this is how you have hand pumps and elevated platform either circular or square rectangular platforms they are same today and this is how they used to and this is where they used to bathe and it were it was connected to the open the drainage system and they were gushed out of the city or the town now see for example see if this is the bathing area the water used to flow like this get connected to a common channel and that is where that is how they were drained out of the city or drained out of the residential areas and this is the play. this is uh, okay the picture from lothal then when you look at dolavira this is the reservoir you must have listened to this aspect whenever okay we talk about uh, architecture or the achievements of indus valley civilization people we always talk about the dolavira reservoir okay and this is without water when dried this is with water and to your surprise let me tell you there was a single stone so this was this is a rock cut reservoir is a massive stone hillock on the hillock they have cut the single stone in the sense i am talking about monolithic rock cut i am using the words look at the words okay i said mirror finish pillars stone work sculpture monolithic rock cut this reservoir is the monolithic rocket reservoir and this can be considered as one of the earliest rocket architectures in the world why because the same rocket architecture becomes very famous in india right from the time of 
Pallavas, Cholas, Chalukyas, etc. So the Dholavira Reservoir is one of the earliest rocket reservoirs in the world or rocket technique in the world. And this is again from the Dholavira. This is a signboard. Maybe this may be a board to one of the important persons of the town or maybe to an important community hall, maybe a street, maybe a market. We do not know. It was embedded into a wooden board and then they have used stone shells, etc. Everything is gone, but the signboard is remaining. So by this, we understand that whatever the homes they have constructed or whatever the utilitarian homes constructions they had, they were named beautifully. We do not know what they meant, but they had naming to it like we do today, isn't it? We have our home and at the door we have a name plate reading Ramakrishna Kongala assistant professor. And there is no much change. And going further, out of India, because see, after the partition of India 1947, we have lost most of the Indus Valley sites to Pakistan. That is where Harappan, Mohanjadaro, Chenudaro are. And post independence, we have tried a lot and we have discovered more than 1200 Indus Valley sites in India. And part of that are Dholavira and Lothar. Imagine if we have not found Dholavira, then what would be the case? You would have never understood how stone was used in Indus Valley civilization. Why? Because stone has been an important element of Indian art and architecture for at least not less than 5 millennium, 5000 years. So there is this place in Afghanistan, which is part of Indus Valley civilization, Mundigal. So in this Mundiga, a research was done and they could find an arrangement, a construction which is called as temple by many people. A French historian, Jane Mary Castle, even Indian okay, historians like Jagatpati Joshi, etc. When they have written about this, they have mentioned it as temple. Why? Because it do not match with any of the any of other royal or domestic constructions and then in the sites coming to India in Rajasthan there is a site Indus Valley site called Kalibanga and there is also another site called Banavali near Kalibanga there is another site where uh, yellow bangles were found which is called as Pili Banga Kalibanga means black bangles Pili Banga means yellow bangles and in this site, we could find seven fire altars or the Yagya Vedis. I'll try to connect all of them. Now see, after the Kalibanga fire altars, we could find the same fire altars without much difference in Banavali, Atranji Keda, Malhar and also in Mathura. This is the Naga temple in Mathura, the excavation of Naga temple. So the continuity always there. It is never that there was some discontinuity between Indus Valley civilization to Vedic era to the post Mauryan Mathura era. There was no discontinuity. That is what I wanted to make you people understand. The usage of brick is continuous. The usage of stone is continuous. There is no change. The structures are continuous. The way streets, homes, drainages, sewages are constructed are continuous. There is no discontinuity. And thus, from understanding few elements of Indus Valley civilization, what do we come to the conclusion? The conclusions are like this. First thing, it was not just brick, but the stone also was predominantly used by the Indus Valley civilization people. Especially the stone pillars. 
why because we talk about stone pillars during the time of ashoka and we should be able to link it to indus valley civilization and the second outcome understanding for us is the rocket architecture the earliest rocket technique used by indus valley civilization people to construct the reservoir of dholavira and then third aspect stone sculpture or stone polish which again is important element of indian art and architecture during the mauryas and post mauryas and then the fourth one is the existing of the fire altars even during the indus valley civilization post indus valley civilization and thereafter these are the four important factors you have to keep in mind i repeat usage of stone in indus valley civilization rocket technique in dholavira stone polish from dholavira and then fire altars we have found at kalibanga why because there is continuity going further now see i said we are entering into vedic era see vedic era basically what did people do people were okay the population was le less and the forests were dense and that is the reason instead of because stone was not available everywhere making of bricks was tedious it needed lot of population and that is the reason they started using the wood and this period of using the wood predominantly was called as mahavana period i repeat mahavana in the sense the great forest era and look at this the first picture in rural areas this is how even today the huts are made and the second picture here is very interesting and it is a far from the north where in the western ghats nilgiri hills there is a tribe called as toda so the huts of the todas are called as doguls so the doguls have a unique horse shoe shaped entrance remember this i am saying you remember each and every element i am talking about all of them will come into the discussion in the coming slides i will link them the first one a normal huts how what is the shape of the huts you see the shape of the huts is dome shaped horse shoe shaped dogul entrances the toda houses in the nilgiris especially at the border of tamil nadu and kerala the fencing the wooden fencing and this is how vedic villages were there used to be a, a clear fencing to the village and to that fencing there used to be an entrance if you go to villages uh, did you see the stable where this cows sheep etc are kept so they have a circular kind of establishment and they will be having a entrance all made of either wood branches twigs leaves etc and through this okay they used to enter and they used to come out and what is this this is cow you know the south indian word gopuram comes from ear cow means go and then through this it is passing into the puram and that is how the gopuram emerges anyways just remember how their villages were they were like gated communities we see today with a proper entrance gate and fencing but all of them done in what all of them done in wood wood is important element here during the vedic era right now see let me try to connect all the aspects that we have seen till now have you seen this shape the dome shape right and the entrances gated communities see 
this is how what they used to do is they used to use the wood wooden poles but then the problem is when you are planting this wooden poles into the earth the termites may eat they get decay and that is the reason they started using the pots and the same wooden pole and pot was copied onto the stone and these became stone pillars now you go to any temples this is how the pillars are the base are of the pots kumba and these are the pillars stamba the concept of kumba and stamba comes from here see what is its origin it is so simple the natural sustainable form of pot and wooden pole copied onto the stone and this fencing for example if you have visited any of the buddhist stupa there is a fencing around for example if this is buddhist stupa there is a fencing around the stupa all of them are made in stone but where are they copied from they are copied from the wooden fencing that you see here and the same from this entrance gate i said gopuram from this comes the concept in buddhist art called as toran and the same entrance becomes gopuram in south india and the same element traveled out of india and it was called pailu or torai so if you go to south korea japan they are called as torai and if you go to china see for example you must have seen beautiful buildings the buddhist buildings of south korea japan cambodia china their entrances are like this and where do you think these entrances have emerged from these entrances have emerged and they have their history in indian entrances right and then see the usage of brick usage of stone right i said dressing of the stone was there during indus valley civilization and the same dressing technique of the stone and then the huts that were used to be there both of them were combined together to give such aspects on the caves or stones this cave is from bihar which is called as lomas rishi cave now you see they could have taken some wood leaves and they would have made this hut very easily but then they did not use that perishable material they wanted to make a hut into the cave and that is the reason in the same style they have carved it into the cave cave architecture and what is the technique that they have used they have used the same technique that was used during indus valley civilization dressing of the stone and this is how see in a sense everything that we see during the mauryan era pre mauryan era post mauryan era all of them have their origin in the pre existing techniques nothing that they have invented there is nothing that they have invented then even even that also even during the cholas palvas rashtrakutas chalukyas they have come from the predating techniques even during the islamic architecture also there are many elements that they have taken from the indian society even during the colonial era also i will show you the best example is rashtrapati bhavan i will show you the photo of rashtrapati bhavan and you will understand and you will be surprised how beautifully the elements the indian elements and the european elements were combined together to make the buildings so now two elements we are done with and i have made you understand how elements were there in indus valley civilization vedic civilization and both put together how they will give rise to the future artistic or architectural elements now so next after this we will get into shramana era and what is this shramana era shramana era in the sense where uh, there were uh, the philosophical teachers like buddha mahavira makkali gosa like ajivikas ajivikas charvakas so all these shramana movements were there and during this time how by getting influenced from the pre existing styles of art and architecture 
the buddhist now the segregation is slowly happening but the buddhist art jain art hindu art etc etc is coming up okay now here then we are done with indus valley elements we are done with vedic elements and how both of them are put together to give rise the further the further elements right now let us so before getting into the discussion of this buddhist elements etc let me make uh, one thing very clear to you there is misconception among us that the stupas are buddhist elements or buddhist artistic elements then you are mistaken why because there is a beautiful work by a british officer engineer whose name is vincent a smith he has done a very good archaeological survey of mathura and he has written a book with the title the jain stupa in the sense stupas were common to jains stupas were common to buddhists and stupas were also common to hindus it was not a sectarian art and architecture i repeat the stupas were used by everybody equally and that is the reason he found many jaina stupas in mathura and he has written a very good book about it it is available on archives.org you can download and you can read this is one thing so you are clear that stupas and what is stupa basically see whenever Uh, there is a tradition of burying the people even during indus valley civilization also there were burial grounds we have found and how were they buried they were buried in the alignment of north south direction so obviously whenever you are digging a pit and you are burying somebody what happens the soil on the okay the uh, ground will bulge and from this emerges the stupa the egg shaped andakara egg shaped structure that was used by the jains buddhists and hindus equally during the era and another concept which was predominantly there was a tribal concept and was used by everybody is a concept called as chaitya vriksha or vriksha chaitya or kalpadruma in the sense they used to worship the trees and if you go to villages if you go to tribal areas you can see today even in my village also there is a tree there is a stage stage built around the tree and all the village people they gather there and they chit chat and this is a common village scene in any part of india irrespective of the region if you go to tribal areas this is more they will bring a stone or their uh, gods they keep under the tree and along with the gods they also start worshiping the tree so the worship of tree was common and that concept is called as chaitya vriksha i repeat chaitya vriksha the references of chaitya vriksha or kalpadruma are much available in vishnu puran and mahabharata also equally so two elements i am talking here the stupa and the uh, kalpadruma or chaitya viksha both equally were existing even before the buddha and the same elements were predominantly used by the or used in the buddhist art now let us go further now what is buddhist art all about because you are all familiar that the central figure of buddha, uh, buddhism is the buddha himself and when you look at buddhist art and architecture they are all related to the life of buddha for example elephant it is related to the birth of buddha because it came in the dream of mahamaya devi next bull bull represents the youth the marriage of the buddha the horse the horse represents the nishkramana 
Buddha leaving the home. And then the Bodhi tree. The Bodhi tree is where in Bodh Gaya, Buddha was sitting and he was meditating. He attained Nirvana. So the Bodhi tree is the symbol of Nirvana. And after attaining Bodhi, uh, Nirvana in Bodh Gaya, he went to Sarnath through Kashi. In Sarnath, he has given the first lecture, wherein the concept of four and eight. Chattari Arya Satchani, four noble truth and then eightfold path, Ashtangika Marga. So he has delivered this message to his favorite or his disciples, five disciples there in the deer park of Sarnath. So the first lecture or the first sermon, which is called as Dharma Chakra Parivartana Sutta or Dharma Chakra Parivartana Sutra. This is the symbol or icon. Deer park are represented by the deers or the disciples. And he has said eight fold path with the eight spoked wheel. And then later on, he reaches Kushinagar. He leaves his mortal remains. Mahaparinirvana. And Stupa is the representation of his death. So after him, the philosophy of Buddhism has become into three Sharanas. Tisarana. What are they? Buddham Sharanam Gachami, Dharmam Sharanam Gachami and Sangam Sharanam Gachami. You can see. So the trident. Buddham Sharanam Gachami, Dhammam Sharanam Gachami and Sangam Sharanam Gachami. The lotus, the lotus has eight petals. Eight petals means eight fold path. See, this is how. And then this is the emblem of Republic of India. But then this is the capital, lion capital of Ashoka. And how many lions are there? Four lions are there. And what are they doing? They are roaring. In the sense, what is this? This is the Buddha who has got enlightenment and he is teaching. The roaring lion is the representation of the enlightened Buddha who is teaching in all the directions. And there is Abacus. In this Abacus, you have Ashoka Chakra. It is called Ashoka Chakra, but originally it was always called as Dhamma Chakra. Dharma Chakra. How many spokes are there? 24 spokes are there. And then four animals. What are those four animals? You have lion, elephant, bull and horse. So the two visible are the horse and the bull. And horse is related to the Nishkramana. Going away from the home and the bull is related to Yavana, the youth of the Buddha. And this is what is all about. If you understand these five, six elements, whichever the Buddhist Chaitya or the Vihara, See, again, two words are coming in. What is that? One is Chaitya. The second one is Vihara. Sorry. It should be B. Vihara. So what is Chaitya? Chaitya is a prayer hall. And Vihara is a dormitory. See, the word Vihar, in a sense, roaming around. So whenever you are roaming around, after you complete, what do you want? You have some accommodation. And that accommodation was called Vihar. So the monks used to go around then they have to stay somewhere. So their accommodation is called as Vihar. And these Viharas were much in the Bihar region. The word Bihar comes from Vihar. And then whenever, wherever they are staying, they wanted some place to pray. So nearby their own place, they have carved out some places. They never used to stay there, but they used to pray there. And that prayer halls were called as Chaityas, Chaitya and Vihara. So when you visit a Chaitya or when you visit a Stupa, the Maha, the, that symbolizes the Mahaparinirvana of Buddha. You can find all these elements. The symbol of Tisharana or three Ratnas of Buddhism, three jewels of Buddhism, the first sermon of Buddhism. I have shown you in the previous slides, if you remember, see here, many people are worshipping what? Many people are worshipping a tree and there is a railing around the tree. 
And what are they doing? They are worshipping the tree. If they are worshipping the tree, what does that mean? That means that they are worshipping something related to the enlightenment of Buddha. So earlier, everything related to Buddha was worshipped in form of symbols, icons, but not as Buddha. And that form of, so wherever these symbols are used, so Buddha is not there. Buddha will not be there. So all the symbols are used. That form of Buddhism is called as Hinayana form of Buddhism. And if anthropomorphic, the human form of Buddha is used, then it is called as Mahayana. See, there is a great confusion among the students, especially about what Hinayana and Mahayana is. They only have English definition saying Hinayana is the lesser vehicle, Mahayana is the larger vehicle. But then they don't understand anything. See, simple concept. Hinayana, where is Hinayana? Hinayana is within India or Sri Lanka. Mahayana is out of India. It traveled out of India. That is the reason they use the word the larger vehicle, the bigger vehicle and the smaller vehicle. But the truth is Hinayana is where only the aspects related to the icons of Buddha are used. But in Mahayana Buddhism, Buddha has a human form. Right. Now, see, uh, this is, I said you, the stupa is the central element and originally when Ashoka has built those 8,000 stupas, he, oh, he has built them in the bricks. Now, when you ask me, where did the brick concept come from in this valley civilization? And then he also has used the mirror finished pillars, Ashokan pillars. Only Ashokan pillar and the brick stupas were there. But later on, during the Shungas, a railing was added to the stupa. And also a top portion was added. And by the time Shatavahanas have come, they have added the entrances also. Now see, if you have understood that initial two, three slides, Okay, to understand the origin of everything is easy. Now, what is the structure that is there on the stupa here? How is it looking like? It is looking like, like, like this. What is it? This is a tree and this is a railing, fencing. Now, you understand where does this tree and fencing concept come from? From the prehistoric times, the people used to worship the tree by putting a railing around it. And that is the same railing. Why? That is the same railing that you see to the Bodhi tree also. So this is now the status of Sanchi Stupa. In different three eras, this is the stage it has reached. And this is Amaravati Stupa, which is there in Andhra Pradesh. The decoration on Amaravati Stupa is high. Why? Because many elements inspired from Hinduism, Jainism, etc. have been added. And this stupa is the form of Vajrayana form of Buddhism. Because rituals, sacrifices, all these start here. For example, if you notice here, one, two, three, four, five, some four or five pillars are standing here. And this is where they used to keep the offerings. Like in South Indian temples, if you go, you have an element called as Bali Peetam. So people say, what is that Bali Peetam? Bali, Bali means in Sanskrit sacrifice, not cutting or uh, okay, um, uh, sacrificing the animals. So whatever you have, you give it. That is sacrifice. You offer a flower. Before offering, it was yours. You were the owner. After offering, the God became the owner. So this has started and that is the reason Amaravati Stupa is the Vajrayana form of Stupa. Sanchi Stupa earlier was the Hinayana Stupa without no anthropomorphic human forms of Buddha, but now it is Mahayana form of Stupa. Now you say me there are two Stupas here. Now understand, before that understand one concept. So now Stupa is what? Stupa is representation of Buddha or Maha Nirvana, Nirvana form of Buddha, right? Now, the same stupa has become miniature. You remember, for example, today you want to gift somebody, you will give a miniature Eiffel Tower or Taj Mahal. 
Why? Because they are miniature. For what? So whenever you are traveling, you can carry them very comfortably and easily. The same way the stupa model was miniature to this. So these such structures, they are not there. I have not. So such structures are called as votive stupa. Votive stupa or they are also called as mannat stupa. I said you during the lecture, you will come across a lot of terminologies. Mannat stupa or the votive stupa. Now here there are two stupas. And where, where are these stupas basically? If you visit Ajanta Ellora caves, these stupas you find inside the caves. So whichever cave you find inside the stupa, then that becomes Chaitya. If the caves are not having stupas, then that is where the monks used to stay and it is called as Vihara. So now out of both one and two, will you please say me which one is Mahayana and which one is Hinayana? You can please uh, drop the message if you understand. I saved you. If there are only icons and nothing human form of Buddha, then it is Hinayana. And if there is Buddha's form, then it is Mahayana. This is Mahayana and this is Hinayana. Right. So going further. Along with the Chaitagrihas, Viharas, Stopas, the Buddhist caves, the cave art also started in India. Why? What is the reason? Many, many people ask me, sir, what is the reason caves like Ajanta, Ellora caves, Kaneri caves, Karle caves, okay, all Baja caves, okay, especially Maharashtra region and even the Karnataka also. You have a lot of caves, especially if you go to Badami, you have wonderful caves. Now I said you, this is the hut model of Todas, right? Dogul. You have horseshoe shape. This is vault roof, isn't it? The same vault roof was copied onto the buildings. And the same vault roof was made in the caves also. And see, the face of this hut became the face of the Buddhist cave. And you know, let me tell you the same structure, the same horseshoe shape goes on to become an ornamental element in South Indian temples, Dravidian temples. And what are they called? They are called as Kudu. Kudus. And Kudu is what? Kudu is a word for nest in Dravidian style of languages. In Telugu, it is called as Gudu. In Tamil, it is called as Kudu. Now, what was the need for them to build these caves? Chaitagrihas, Viharas, etc., etc., stay there. The reason was always they used to, okay, every year we used to have rainy season for four months. And that four months concept is called as Chaturmase. Four months. So during these four months, what do they do is they do not travel because it is heavily pouring, it will be a disturbance. And that is the reason they used to stay in one place and to do meditation, etc., enhance their spiritual power. So they have to stay. And that is when they have built the caves. They have dug the caves with what? With the patronage of the royal families. Funding also should be their right. And what did they do? When they dug the caves, they have copied the wooden style of architecture which was present in the lower onto the stone. And that is the reason the same shape became the window of the cave. This is Chaitagraha basically. If you get into this, okay, Chaitagraha. What is another simple uh, way of differentiating Chaitagraha and Vihara is Chaitagraha is very intricately decorated. Viharas are very simple like our present day homes. Why? Right? Because our present day homes do not have any art. If any, if you go to the villages, the poorest of the poor man's hut will have some aesthetic sense. But now the richest and the richest of the man's home, like Antilla, they are just geometric structures. They do not have aesthetic art in them. See here, for example, the walls. Now see by looking at these walls, what kind of Chaitagraha it is. Hinayana Chaitagraha or Mahayana Chaitagraha? This is Mahayana Chaitagraha. Why? Because you can see anthropomorphic form of 
the people related to Buddha. Maybe it is a Padmapani, okay, Vajrapani, Bodhisattvas, etc. Different Buddhistic elements. Now, where did they inspire all these sculptures on the walls of the caves, temples, etc. From, from this. This is the tradition, the rural tradition. What they used to do, the tribal people, the rural people, they used to decorate and art on the mud walls. The art on the mud walls became the sculptures on the stone walls. See, I am talking about the evolution. I am talking about the okay emergence. I am also talking about the interconnectivity became between all the elements that we are looking at. Okay, now at last coming to Ashokan era, right? What are the elements that we have? Two important elements. What are they? The stupa and the Ashokan pillar. Now tell me, is this Ashokan pillar coming for the first time? No, it was there during Indus Valley civilization. People have used stone and made. And then what is this? This is the lion. And what does the lion represent? Lion represents the enlightened Buddha and his roaring, the giving of lecture. What is that called? Dharma Chakra Parivartana Sutta. You can see a lot of stupas here, smaller stupas. The smaller stupas are called as votive stupas or manat stupas. Why? Because many monks must be there. So based on their stature, the size of the stupa. All of them are made in bricks. Brick is not new because we know it since the Indus Valley civilization. And then do you remember this? What is this? This is Toran in the stupa entrance. Toran was already there, right? And then the railing. See how this railing was earlier in the wood. Now is made on the stone. And even though they made on the stone, did they stay, change the style? No, the way it was made on wood, the same way it is made on the stone. Here also see, like how people used to make an entrance gate by tying the two poles and then some two or three sticks like this. And they used to tie it here at this interjunctions. If you're doing it on the stone, there is no need for this, but then it should look like that that artistic aesthetic sense should be brought in and they brought in. And this is what this is under the egg shaped stupa. Originally inside it is the brick stupa, but over it is the stones laid by the Shungas and Shatavahanas later. And the top of the stupa you see, okay, you have a central element standing like a pole and then the railing. What does it remind you? It remind you of the Vruksha Chaitya. Okay, the railing. The railing is called as Harmika. Okay, and then within this, you have a pole. On this pole, you have three layers one, two, three. And what are these three layers? These three layers represents the three Ratnas of Buddhism. This is called Yasti, basically, the tree part. What are they? Buddham Sharanam Gachami, Dhammam Sharanam Gachami, and Sangam Sharanam Gachami. Here also see the three levels. One, two, three. Has got the same meaning. Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. You must visit actually. If you visit one of the Sanchi Stupas, you will be able to identify the elements, whatever I have been telling you till now. Right. Going ahead. Now, during that time, post Mauryan era, there were three schools. What are they? One school is called as Gandhara school. The other school is Mathura school and then Amravati school. The Gandhara, the present Gandhara, okay, you understand, right? Takshila and Gandhara the present Afghanistan, Madura, the present India, and then Amravati, the present South India. See, in Gandhara art, you predominantly find Hellenistic, in the sense, the Greek elements in the sculpture. For example, look at this hair of this lady. 
how are they looking the same wavy motion of hairs are seen in the sculpture of buddha also and then even the dressing also this is the wrap, wrapping of the cloth and what is this wrapping this wrapping of the cloth is called a shalya wrap if you go down south even today also the tribal people they have this shalya wrap so the wavy motion of the hair like the greeks gods and goddesses in their art same way but when it comes to mathura okay you do not find any, any greek influence but you find the influence from the pre existing gods and goddesses of the region what is that yakshi and yakshini if you go to mathura museum you find lot of yakshinis predating the buddha predating the mahavira they were all in those days where the worshiping gods and goddesses for example the best yaksha and yaksha basically we know is kubera so even in those days also the god kubera was worshiped as yaksha and from this influence they have made the buddha like this matching the elements but then what is the difference between okay the gandhara and madhura art here the hairs are looking like locks here hairs are looking like wavy motion here he is looking like a simple for example the facial features of both of them are looking same simple but when it comes to mathura buddha there is lot of emotion dhyana in the face spiritual feeling in the face and another important thing you see the halo what is this called as this is called as halo and in indian language that is called as prabhavali whoever the person is godly figure enlightened figure he will have a halo for example okay uh, the jesus has halo around his head and the halo here is not decorated isn't it do you see decoration here no but when it comes to mathura art the halo here is very intricately designed lot of drawings are there clear and then coming to amravati school of art in amravati school of art you find a lot of extensive introduction of the rituals matching the indian elements for example i said 1 2 3 4 5 pillars are there these pillars are called as upaskambhas and this is where you will be offering and you will be worship for example if you look at some structures here on this this has become the structure of dravidian temples and when you look at this this buddha here who is wearing the cloth on above the one shoulder and keeping another shoulder open which is not in the other schools of art becomes the important precursor for the bronze sculptures of the cholas and pallavas observe this buddha carefully and compare it with the chola bronze sculptures their shapes look same similar like this so amaravati school of art gave rise to the indian south indian art and architecture specially right how many schools i have said here gandhara mathura and amaravati now coming to the jainism i think i should be little quick in jainism also you can find the caves so earlier most of the jain again same chaturmasi concept where in the four months it will be a rainy season they have to take shelter they used to okay do all this right and then there are a lot of caves one of the finest and largest caves of the jains is there in gwalior so these are this is the photo of the gwalior and later on they started building their religious places also so in the north okay especially i see, uh, see uh, let me give you one small uh, uh, kind of idea uh, sorry for that uh, a poor map of uh, india now see if this is the map of india when you take this eastern area bihar odisha andhra etc and then 
Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu to Sri Lanka. Many Tamilians, they do not know, once upon a time, Tamil Nadu was having a great amount of Buddhism in it, even the Jainism also. The famous lady Mani Meghalai is a Buddhist lady from Tamil Nadu only. Bihar, Odisha, Andhra Pradesh, etc., all this area is Buddhism. This may not be true, but then a simple idea for the students to remember. But then Western okay, area, West region, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra and Karnataka and some portion of Madhya Pradesh. They're all, it is all about Jainism. So this portion is Jain and this portion is Buddhism. So the West coast or Western uh, line is Buddhism, Eastern line and the Western line is the Jainism. This is all. And then down south, okay, because Jainism, uh, Jains, they believe in not traveling or crossing the waters. And that is the reason they got restricted till Tamil Nadu. But then the Buddhists, they have crossed Tamil Nadu and they have entered Sri Lanka also. Sri Lanka is the Buddhist majority country, right? Isn't it? They have a lot of, and what form of Buddhism they follow? They follow Hinayana form of Buddhism. Okay, right. Even today also, the wrapping, etc., it matches the Hinayana form of Buddhism. Now, so the temples of the Jains are mostly built in white marble. Why? Because in Gujarat and Rajasthan region, the white, white marble is predominantly present, easily available. And in North India, the worshipping place of the Jains is called as Derasar. But then coming to the south, like Karnataka and Maharashtra, marble is not available, but granite is available and sandstone is available. And that is the reason they have built. Now see, the marble is used in Rajasthan, Gujarat region, and the style of temple of Jains is different. This is Nagra style of temple. But when it comes to south, the material is changing and the style is also changing. This is Dravidian temple, but dedicated to the Jains. Why? Because region has changed. So based on the availability of the material, we are making the temple. And in south, in Maharashtra and Karnataka and some parts of Kerala, the Jain temples are called as Basadi. The word Basadi comes from Vasati. Vasati means a domestic place where you live. So Vasati becomes Vasati. Like Bihar becomes Bihar, Vasati becomes Vasati. So two words are there. In North India it is called Derasar, in South India it is called as Vasati. But what is the style? If it is in South India, they have followed Dravidian style, used sandstone and granite and cyst for making the temples. But in the North, especially Rajasthan and Gujarat, the Northwest, they have used the Sangamarmar or the white marble. Even the sandstone also they have used. Now, see, there are Tirthankaras. The Tirthankaras are the central element, the teaching gods. How many are there? 24 Tirthankaras are there in Jainism. So here is the okay Tirthankara. So all the 24 look similar, right? But then how do you differentiate? We can differentiate them by finding a small icon at the base of their seat right? because they, they are naked to understand this also you have to have a clear understanding of what buddhism and jainism philosophy is buddha what does he believe in he believes in middle path madhyama marga he do not believe in eating excess and he do not believe in starving also. He says eating excess is danger, starving is also danger. Meat, whatever you can digest, eat that much. But in Jainism, the philosophy is different. It is extreme. And so let us see, you see, I will remove all the clothes. Let snakes come and bite me, ants come and bite me. Nothing should happen to my body because whatever this body is there, it will go off. What remains is my soul forever. So my soul is not going to get hurt. And so when you look at 24 Tehadangaras, all look similar. So how do you differentiate? By uh, using or by a concept called as Lanchana. Lanchana means icon. So for example, if you want to identify Adinath or Rishabhadev, so at the base of the uh, sculpture of the Adinath or Rishabhadev, you will find a bull. That is his icon. 
If it is Mahavira, the 24th one, then you will find a lion, the Simha. And here, okay, you, you will find a lot of Tirthankara standing like this. And what is this mudra? This mudra is called as Kayotsarga mudra. Kayotsarga mudra, or it is also called as Kadga. Kadga means the sword. He is standing straight like a sword. And you know, while standing like a sword, he will be doing meditation. He will be going to Samadhi Stiti. And this is the most difficult. Why? Because you are sitting and you are going to Samadhi is not difficult. It is easy. Because your body, your mind, when it goes into Samadhi, it need not control your body. So you are on the ground, you are lying. That is not a difficult thing. But when you are standing, your mind has to control your body. Why? Because that is how you, you, you can stand. And then you have to go to Samadhi. That is the most difficult level of meditation. So when you look at the Jain Tirthankaras, they are standing and what they are doing is very impossible for normal people to achieve. That is the meaning of this Katka Mudra. And before the Derasar, Derasar means you understand, right? The temple in the north, okay, the Jain temple is called. And Basadi towards the south. So before the Basadi or the Derasar, you have a Stamba which is called as Manas Stamba. Manas Stamba. Man. When you say Man, Dhan, Man, Pran. So there is a word. Man means ego, self respect. So whenever you are entering into the Basadi, you have to bow your head at this pillar, saying that I offer or I remove all my ego before you and enter into the place of worship to listen to the teachings of Tirthankara. Right? And then there are a lot of, in Jain temple, there are a lot of women, female uh, uh, goddesses, Yakshi, Yakshinis, etc. who are worshipped. And especially in Jain temple, if you go into the central Mandapa hall, you find a lot of goddesses on the ceiling like this how many they are 16 sola or they are also called as sodasha but who are they they are the goddesses who give you the knowledge vidya devis so how many sodasha vidya devis all these are 16 goddesses different forms of saraswati so whenever a tirthankara is born the mother is taken care okay the lactating mother is basically taken care by the Vidya Devis and they will give all the knowledge to one of the Tirthankaras. So that's it. Uh, that is what is all about uh, Buddhism and Jainism art. Now coming into the coming to the concept of the temples. Okay, I said again the concept. You remember when I was talking about Indus Valley civilization, I has quoted, I have quoted the place like Kali Banga, Pili Banga, Banavali, wherein you we have found Vedic altars or you also called them as Yajna Vedi. Yajna Vedi, in the sense where the Yajna or Homa is performed. So now let me give you a very short. See, there is a lot of textual reference to all this that I have made here, but a very short introduction I can say you the sun, right, and the earth. So out of the earth is made the altar, the bricks. And the source for this Shatapata Brahmana. And the sun. The sun becomes the Agni in the altar. And the source is Rigveda. The first shloka. Agni Mile Purohitam. So the Agni is worshipped and he is the mediator between the people and the God. So the altar is made of the earth and the sun becomes the Agni. And from this emerges a Purusha. Virata Purusha, the 10th Mandala of Rigveda talks about him and this is how he is represented and the same way a temple is imagined and built in the sense for example this portion of temple is called as Griva and what is Griva or you can also call him call it as Kanta Kant. and what does Kanta means Kanta means the neck and this portion of the temple is called as Kati Kati means the waste of the God. And this portion is called as Pada. Pada means the feet. 
so whatever the body elements are the terminologies that are there in the god or in the human being the same elements and names are given to the temple also griva and you know what is this portion is called this portion is called as skanda skanda or kanda or kand the shoulder griva skanda kantha khati pada this portion is called as janga janga means the thigh portion above the knees see and you will you will not believe because you people are not aware this is the normal terminology used for identifying the elements of the temple and they very much match with the names that we identify our body parts with in a sense a temple is a representation of human body a temple is a representation of human who is represented in turn as the god and this is in simple see this needs lot of explanation at least not, uh, not less than 2 hours of explanation i am just trying to explain you within 2 minutes okay you just understand the concept if you have any doubt you can drop it so from that evolution what are the temple styles we have in india is this is the list you will be surprised there were vedic temples okay uh, indus valley temples and then the temples before the mode before the buddha we found in punjab region the coins whose coins the coins of audumbaras so on the coins of audumbaras there is a beautiful book written by alexander cunningham the coins of india so the ancient coin the coins uh, somewhere around uh, okay uh, uh, 700 uh, bc 800 bc to 700 ad between that he has compiled all the coins and he has written a book so numismatics the study of coins is called numismatics so in that audumbara coins you find lot of temple models when it comes to classical india in the south you remember the mahabalipuram the badami patadakkal aihole hampi okay hampi is a later uh, okay temple uh, then uh, many places in uh, tamil nadu okay uh, all these places were cut, cut out of the rocks and they were called as rock cut temples and then there are structural temples what is the difference between rock cut and skull structure is in rock cut you remove the rock but in sculptural temples you add the rock step by step so in andhra tamil nadu maharashtra karnataka in even in himachal okay Uh, in himachal also you have rock cut temples you will be surprised the name of the temples in himachal are called masrur rock cut temples in tripura there are rock cut temples whose name is there is a beautiful place and must visit in your lifetime that is unakoti and in bihar we anyways have uh, uh, the caves in rajgir nalanda bodgaya okay now the famous styles of the temples after later on have become are called nagara temples basically when you say nagara people simply think it as north indian style of temple dravida a south indian style of style of temple and visara is between the north and the south i will explain you in the next slide and the temples in the gujarat and rajasthan region are called as maru pradesh maru pradesh in the sense dry area desert area which is maru gurjara is gujarat region so maru gurjara style or gujarat rajasthan area was also ruled by the solankis and the temples in this region are also called as solanki temples but the solanki temples or maru gurjara temples are verily nagara temples and kalinga temples kalinga temples are in odisha region the temples of odisha region are also nagara temples but slight change in the style now coming to okay the medieval era okay if you go to kerala and karnataka especially that uh, mysore mangaluru and then kerala belt if you see you have temples whose bases are made of granite stone but the top for example is padmanabha swami temple if you go to padmanabha swami temple uh, in the back side of padmanabha swami temple you have uh, sri krishna temple so the the base of the temple is full of uh, granite but then the top is of the wood why because structural uh, comfort if you are using the stone it may fall if you are using the wood it is very light most of the homes also are same the bases for example padmanabhapuram palace all the superstructures are built in wood but the bases are made in granite stone 
such temples or such structures are called as kastamaya but then if you come to maharashtra region the, there are temples which are in black color cyst is used and such temples are called as maratha temples or hemadpanthi temples if you go to bengal region assam region you don't find stone and that is the reason if you don't find stone they used to make temples out of mud baked terracotta temples so most of the temples you find in assam and west bengal are terracotta temples what is that unesco world heritage site there is this place called as bishnupur bishnupur is the place for the terracotta temples and in assam region especially the kamakya temple kamakya temple is built on a hill called as nilanchal so that style of temple is called as nilanchal temple so how does it look like okay it will be looking like uh, such structure same uh, that is also a variant of nagara style only and katkuni temples i want i'd like to say katkuni what is katkuni kat is basically kasta wood and kuni is a stone so in himalayan region to avoid the earthquake see one of the ancient earthquake technique used by the indians so one layer they will use wood and another layer they will use the stone so due to this the structure will not be stiff so whenever there is earthquake the the structure will okay tremble and again it will settle the use of wood and stone are called as katkuni temples or katkuni style of architecture a beautiful anti earthquake technique that is used since ages in india and nagara temples i said they are not indian temples but most of them are made in sandstone why because in the central india and towards the north what is available sandstone is available but dravidian temples when you come towards the south sandstone is not available but what is available granite is available so dravidian temples are mostly predominantly made in granite the hardest rock in the world understanding Clear. Now, so that was a small. So now look at this. So this portion, the triangle that you see here is Nagara temples, and this portion that you see here is Dravidian temples. And the region between this, this portion, the combination of the north and south, is where you find Vesara temples. The, you have elements of nagara also and dravidian also so this region is what granite region see what is the influence of geography i say geography is the mother of all sciences in the world everything comes from geography for example south indians eat rice north indians eat chapati why because that is how the region is that has influenced that geography has influenced our culture heritage okay dress everything because sandstone is available here it is used predominantly in nagara temples granite is available here so it is used and in these stones i said you in this region this is also nagara uh, marugurjara style of architecture or solanki style of architecture but what is used marble is used a lot even in the jain temples also why because here marble is available and here katkuni wood is available plenty so wood plus stone structures are made which is called as katkuni why here stone is not very good quality but because that is youngest stone the himalayas are the youngest mountains in the world and their stone is not as strong as the sandstone or the granite they are very weak so you can break it they are brittle and that cannot be used okay wholly solely for the structure so they use the wood but you come to this region you don't find any stone and what did they use they used terracotta see this is how geography has influenced our art and architecture now the kalinga temples so all the style of temples solanki temples katkuni temples okay uh, nakshatra temples or uh, ratna temples in west bengal region terracotta temples kalinga temples all of them are the variants of nagara temples and in dravidian okay they are all of same style but then between this there are vesara let us look at for example this is one of the classical example of nagara style of temple what is this temple this temple is vishwanatha temple from khajuraho group of temples unesco world heritage site and this is from the western group of temples 
see can you see each and every i said you know peta okay there are many janga see i have written the word janga which means the thai portion griva can you see here griva skanda so all the bodily elements or parts are shown here anyways now we will not be able to but generally i will give you a small difference south indian temples they have gopurams as entrance gates north indian or nagara temples they do not have entrance gates they have instead of gopuram they have toran okay and north indian temple the nagara temples are always on a raised platform dravidian temples are not on the raised platforms north in nagara temples are always in the open area but then for dravidian temples there are always a complex or compound and that is called as prakaram prakaram is a common word clear these are the simple and then okay the shikara specially the shikara or the tower of the north indian nagara the nagara temple is called as shikara but then the tower of dravidian temple is called as vimanam or vimana but then most of the terminology 99% of the terminology okay matches with between the nagara temple and dravidian temple 99% matches because concept is same temple god elements sculpture for example see shiva temple in the north in nagara style and shiva temple in dravidian style is same elements are same there is no change only the physicality changes a little bit that is 1% okay see, this is how it looks but then again it is same for example okay in this also you have see i have mentioned the word griva okay this is griva the neck and then this is the base the pada the pita so even in the dravidian temple also you have the elements that represents the body right so the nagara the dravida temple and visara this is where a little explanation is needed so vishra the word visara comes from vishra there is a small story i would like to say uh, i may take time but then let me say it because whatever i teach at least let me tell you some uh, complete give you complete information see nagara and dravida are there the combination of nagara and dravida is called as visara that is the common thing people say may not be but then both the elements are present in this style of temples so as per what is visara in sanskrit visara means mule m u l e mule so what is mule the mule is the combination of the donkey and horse when donkey and horse are cross bred then gives the mule now the question is see out of dravidian and nagara temple which is horse and which is donkey so if you say dravidian as donkey and north indian nagara as the horse so people may get offended so this do not apply then what where does the word visara comes from it's not like visara is equal to mule there is another meaning for it there is a word called vishra vishra means more space spacious for example look this okay temple this is the belur temple chennakeshava temple so basically how are the temples this is garbhagriha and you have a mandapa that's it but here in this temples you have mandapa this way also in the sense see this temple is so long from this area to this area in the sense the halls of this temple are very spacious vishra or vishal and from the word comes visra very spacious temples are called vishra but then what they use both the elements so the present maharashtra andhra regions they have or the northern karnataka regions they have this visara style of style of temples and best example is the hoysala temples are visara style of temples right now 
so till there we have completed one aspect now what we will do is we will see indo islamic architecture and colonial architecture maybe uh, let me try to finish as quick as possible some 10 15 minutes because i have to take questions also in islamic architecture in india okay post uh, mohammad ghori isn't it mohammad ghazni comes first then mohammad ghori comes and mohammad ghori leaves his favorite slave qutbuddin aibak in india right so qutbuddin aibak starts a slave dynasty delhi sultans and then what are the important elements of uh, okay uh, islamic architecture see now there is nothing called pure islamic architecture in india anything that is there is called indo islamic architecture why because there are lot of elements for example this is humayun stone the first picture that you are seeing is the humayun stone and the second one is also the humayun stone the closer thing the dome is there so one important element of the islamic architecture is dome dome is called as gumbad there is also famous world famous gumbad in south india karnataka which is called as gol gumbad of vijayapura once upon a time it was called bijapur right and then okay you have okay the first one is element i said you is gumbad and second element is arch arch and dome are important elements of indo islamic architecture and what is this arch arch is called as kus like i said gumbad dome is called as gumbad the arch is called as kus clear now what is the in, uh, islamic elements that are indo indian elements that are there this is the chatri chatri is like pavilion umbrella so this chatri is a indian element therefore generations together but then see in, in in islamic architecture you will find this okay uh, star you may be thinking this is solomon star no this is the star of david okay and it is the star of daud also they call right but then in this building itself here you have an element okay visible what is this this looks like a flower bouquet and because it looks like a flower bouquet it is called as guldasta g u l d a s t a guldasta see people who are interested in heritage heritage interpretation and understanding monuments you should download this lecture later on and watch it as many times as possible because i am just giving you a very glimpse a small idea to what heritage interpretation is so the more you dig the better you understand is for example see if we are all tourism professionals let us say you go to humayun stone isn't it as a tourist guide comes to you and narrates whole history of humayun stone but then he will not explain you what this star is he will not explain you what this arch means he will not explain this element what is this flower bouquet guldasta is what is this chatri is what is this gumbad is in the sense you have visited in the sense you have visited somebody you just knew the name and you came back you, you have never you have never bothered to understand that the person same way you have never you are never trying to understand the monument and another important indo islamic feature is absence of sculpture you will not find sculpture in the indo islamic monuments why because islam do not believe in worship murti puja murti worship and that is the reason you find a lot of geometric structures clear now going ahead this to so indo islamic architecture you have lofty entrances in the sense that will bring grandeur to the place see here and this lofty entrances are called as aiwan aiwan means the lofty entrance and in this aiwan see this aiwan this is the entrance this is not a building actually this is one of the entrance to the taj mahal but that itself see how and what is this element this element is chatri and this element is you know now what is that guldasta and this is the arch kus but see this itself is looks like a residential place 
the gates that is how they used to make the gates for the security purpose and this hollow place into the official entrance lofty entrance is called as pishtak p i s h t a q pishtak in the sense the hollow space clear and then one of the important elements of indo islamic architecture are masjids isn't it so i will try to show you a picture of okay a masjid and explain you the details later now that is how these are the few elements that you see okay and another important thing is this dome gumbad isn't it that you are seeing in humayun's tomb is a double dome not a, there are two kinds single dome and double dome how to identify single dome or double dome single domes basically are very flat not having a good shape but then double domes are having a shape of onion they can they can you can also call them as onion domes why because first they will build a shape like this first layer and then they will stuff it and over the stuff they will build the second layer so how many domes the inside one is one dome and the outside one is another dome so how many domes are there two domes and that is the reason the perfect onion shaped domes of indo islamic architecture are called as double domes now coming to the dakkan indo islamic architecture the speciality this is the only one element that is special to dakkan region and nowhere else what is that the arches you see you want to increase the space of the building so what did they do this is this kind of style is called as hypo style building hypo style i repeat hypo style building wherein you have pillars emerging from the ground and pillars height is not going till here within that one or two feet from there itself see if you remember you see this where are the arches the arches are at very high great height here but here if you see especially in dakkan region the arches rises almost from the ground what happens to, due to this it increases the space a lot see what is all the architecture about it is about weight light and space when you observe the colonial architecture indo islamic architecture it is all about this only so why for example see you want to increase the for example this is the home let us say this is the roof but then the height is somewhere around 10 feet so you want to increase the height of the roof so what do you do you have to build it like this i said na you want to increase the space they have to build it like this why do you have to increase the space because when the roof is low in the summer it is too hot when you lift the roof okay the hotness is decreased because they are all from the desert region it used to be hot so having the dome increases the hot inside the monument now they want light yes broad windows because in the huge monument for example take this monument in this huge monument it is very difficult for the light to reach into the interior compartments so light becomes one important element so built like that another space weight also why arch if you are using for example say building something like this if there is weight here it will break but the same structure if you are making a arch like this and built this arch will never fall for example if you go to champaner pavagad there is a famous monument there called as sat kama seven arches since 1000 years the seven arches have not fallen down why because arch is that strong physical element that gives strength to the structure so this is what is the masjid one of the important okay aspect for islamic architecture so i said you know this is iwan the official okay uh, domestic in the sense wherein you can live 
many people can live here so this is i1 the official entrance and this empty space here is called as shan open and in the center of this you have house even today also in karnataka and telangana region house is the word that use they use for a small pond okay lake or water catching container house so here they come they clean there okay the visible body parts and they enter here so here there are three walls like this the front is opening okay and this wall is to the west the west facing wall back so the west facing wall is called as qibla q i b l a and in this qibla there will be a recess a hollow space and here the person will be standing and he will be reading the namaz like this one if you can see here the hollow space in this wall and this hollow space is called as mihrab that is where the namaz is read qibla mihrab shan house and you can also see here what is that uh, minaret the pillar earlier what used to happen is people used to climb on to this minaret and they used to give azan adan or calling for the prayer but nowadays what they do is they only keep the mics on it now it has become only ornamental or decorative it is no more utilitarian so i repeat i want shan house mehrab and the wall that is facing the makka madina the west wall is called as qibla in this qibla wall you have a recess where you will stand and do namaz that is called as mehrab right now there are two misconceptions famous misconceptions people believe that dome and another important aspect of islamic architecture i forgot to say is jali the network so these both are claimed to be brought to india by the moguls or the delhi sultans but for your information this is from badami is called as lower shivalaya and when you look at this dome and the four chatris around will look like the four plus arrangement of the taj mahal so the dome and this at least dates to somewhere around 1400 okay uh, years back somewhere around 6th century to 7th century 1500 at least years in the sense before the arrival of the moguls 1000 years before the arrival of the moguls this was already there and then the jali the net the netted work of the okay uh, moguls and also the arch see this is the barabar cave of bihar 2200 years old post mauryan or during the mauryan element you can see a arch that is beautifully carved on the cave and then in this portion also you can see the netted work the jali work which is very famous in indo islamic architecture now the last i'll take 5 minutes so coming to colonial again there is no pure colonial architecture in india why because lot of elements have been taken from the india for what is that for example see dome is never the european element but then they have added the dome and then these are called as turrets turrets are almost like guldastas guldastas are like four plus arrangement that you have seen in most of the temples in south india and these are called like minarets these are called as turrets the simple minarets but then what is this this style is called as gothic style of architecture 
in the sense in the traditional style of architecture you will see lot of additions and says it it looks like chaos why does it look like chaos because see who are goths goths are the west german people and the russian people once upon a time who used to attack okay the european kingdoms and they used to create chaos killing many people so for example see if this is a structure let us say european building now create chaos in this structure so what you will do is you will start bringing lot of designs to it you are disturbing that traditional style and giving lot of jettings out of it a chaos is created and see in this also it is not simple lot of elements are added and that is the reason this style which is so complex confusing chaos that style is called as gothic style and then coming to the church and many elements that you see in the church are based on the utilitarian based on the weight space and light concept for example you have french windows what is the concept of french windows the concept of light in the churches in the front you have a small opening round opening what is it called it is called as clerestory and what is the work of clerestory it is the surya gavaksha the entrance to the light and then when you come down okay at the entrances at the halls okay the main at the pavilion you see some walls standing like this against the main wall balustrades they are called and what is their work these balustrades they enrich the strength of the wall and then another important aspect is the pagoda style of the roof why they why should they be in pagoda style why because okay the origin of the church is in the snow region so if they if the roofs are flat when there is snow fall it leads to seepage so to avoid the seepage the structure is modified and that is the reason when you go to himalayan region even the himalayan region has got pagoda style it's not the see in many other parts of the country also you will see this himal okay the pagoda style the hut form but they are not prevalent much in this areas you are supposed to and when it goes on to the top the front portion of the church is inspired from the clock towers once upon a time used in the european kingdoms so they used to have a crossroads at the crossroads they used to establish the clock towers and the bell towers also clock and bell towers together so whenever it is a sunday they used to call the masses for the prayer and that element has got embedded with the church and in the church the central portion used to, you will be very spacious and round and that central portion is where okay most of the times the benches are arranged and you will be sitting for the prayer and that central portion open space okay spacious place is called as rotunda rotunda rotate words come from the rotate with the circular spacious portion right and yes the, i said you this is the rashtrapati bhavan and what is this this rashtrapati bhavan's uh, okay central element is inspired from the sanchi stupa and these pillars are inspired from the roman architecture they are called as roman tuscans tusk what is the tusk the teeth of the elephant is tusk okay they look like the teeth of element tusk and that is the reason they are called as tuscans the roman pillars are tuscans and then the flying staircases why the flying staircases because before uh, especially uh, the indo islamic architecture you don't find flying staircases from the islamic and then colonial era you find lot of flying staircases these are called flying staircases in the sense when you climb you are you feel that you are flying into the sky why what is the reason the reason is it brings grandeur to the place for example see you are standing here and all the people are standing here when they see you you look alone you look grand you look majestic to bring that majestic look to the monument there are flying staircases clear 
so this is uh, there are a lot of elements to explain in rashtrapati bhavan but one small el okay few elements that are visible i have explained you and this is called as uh, triumphal arch okay triumphal arch this is basically uh, the india gate right but then triumphal arch is a french concept basically european concept so what do they used to do? whenever they used to win a war over any kingdom so they used to come to a place find a crossroads in that crossroads in the center in the chauraha they used to build this triumphal arch and through this triumphal arch people used to pass so whenever they pass through the triumphal arch they will remember like somebody has won over the other person so this basically is a french and english style of architecture in the center see there is an arch and in the center there is a stone here and this stone is called as keystone so keystone is very important for a building for the arch to stand why because you will be arranging the stones like this and then you will keep a central stone and other stones like this so if you remove this stone all the rest of the stones in the arch they fall it is key to their intactness and that is the reason it is called keystone and again this is cst chatrapati shivaji maharaj terminus mumbai again gothic style of architecture why because see everything is jetting out of the building half hazard chaos but then there is a clock here in this clock it should be clerestory the opening for the air into the church clear and this portion is called as lintel so this is a greek concept basically what is that so the triangle and then there will be okay the pillar so the pillars are called as post and then the triangle portion okay and the center of this is called as tympanum so this is lintel so the concept of post and lintel is greek style of architecture there is greek style of architecture also there are turrets okay the minarets kind of okay the french windows are there and then you can see something is coming out of the building like pipes and these are water outlets but they are not simple pipes pipes they are designed in the form of horrible uh, fearful dragons kind of and they are called as gargoyles g a r g o i l t -E. if you have visited a temple always to the temple uh, towards the when you are standing before the temple towards your right there will be a water outlet and that water outlet is called as pranala it is also called as gaumuk so it is said the gargoyle is like gaumuk the water outlet but it is instead of keeping a simple pipe they have decorated it more beautifully decorated pipe outlet is called as gargoyle so all these elements are there so uh, it's been uh, two hours continuous talk uh, you should excuse me for that because uh, if it was online or uh, with the handouts i would have interacted with you people uh, nicely but then uh, okay i have finished now i'll come back i'll close my sh uh, uh, slides and i'll come back to interact with you take some questions but anyways i am there on social media on insta with the name tourism teacher tourism underscore teacher you can uh, uh, follow me there and ask me any questions because i am always active on insta i will always reply because there are many tourism students who will be uh, asking me questions there so it is an interactive platform i am also there on uh, twitter with the name artist underscore rama so at both places you can follow me and you can ask the questions if not also you can take my contact number from anila ma'am and you can also text me personally there also i'll be uh, answering your questions so that how that's how it was i know uh, i said you uh, 7000 years of history keeping intact uh, uh, continuous flow uh, in two hours is uh, very difficult but then i hope uh, i have done some justice to whatever uh, is to be done within these two hours uh, you should excuse me i said again i repeat uh, for uh, keeping it non interactive uh, thank you for the now i invite you MB from final year BA, PhD, to the work, including the work of the session, and also to propose a vote of thanks.
Yes. Uh, I uh, I think I have a problem with my camera, but uh, we can continue. Yes. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you for that very enlightening session. Um, you know, there was a lot of things as a history student. I did learn about a lot of things, but then there was a lot of things that I did not know, like how, um, you know, the arches, horseshoe archway has continued throughout history or the use of stone from the Indus Valley civilization till now it has been continued. So there are a lot of things that we do miss. And with your session, we were able to pick out those pinpoint those elements uh, about how history has repeated throughout the ages. So thank you very much for that enlightening uh, session. Uh, we do have a couple of questions for you, sir. So would you like to take those questions right now? Yes, if you can read out to me, I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll read it out to you, sir. So one question that we do have is, um, uh, what was the reason behind Buddha to travel from Gaya to Kashi for first sermon? And why was it that, uh, you know, the sermons weren't conducted in any of the famous ghats of Kashi, but in an unknown location at that time at Sarnath. Yeah, uh, one small uh, reason is uh, after Buddha got enlightenment, Nirvana in uh, Bodh Gaya. So Bodh Gaya in those days was, was called as Uruvela. So under the Bodhi tree after he got, he didn't knew what to do. So there was no uh, proper guidance to him. So he started traveling. He came to both Gaya, uh, he came to Kashi and after, even after coming to Kashi also, he was not understanding what to do. There was no proper guidance and he started traveling continuously. And after reaching uh, Sarnath, uh, somewhere around there, it is said that uh, the God Brahma, he came and he said, whatever you have achieved is something that is not achieved by anybody. And you should definitely teach it to uh, someone. And uh, so at Deer Park, Buddha comes across uh, his, th there is a long story I'll tell you. Uh, before becoming Buddha, there is a Diksha that everybody used to take called as Parivrajak Diksha. So when he took Parivrajak Diksha, there were five companions to him already. Ananda, Vappa, Asaji, Baddiya, Ramaputta. So these five people again meet him at Deer Park. So when they see Buddha for the first time, they feel that it is not the same Parivrajak that they had uh, seen him earlier. There is some change in his face. There is some change in his walking. Then they have gone to him and asked, you have changed a lot. There is some change. There is some aura in you. So now will you please teach us whatever you have achieved? And that is where Buddha sits for the first time. And he will uh, teach the Chattari Arya Satchani, four noble truths. And they will ask, so how do we do that? Then he will say eightfold path. Ashtangika Marga to them for the first time. So it is on the request of the five uh, uh, Parivrajaks that he says to them. Uh, thank you, sir. So moving on to this ne uh, next question. Uh, another participant has asked this question. What made them choose the location of the structure? So architectural, uh, the sculptures and um, makers of temples in stupas and viharas what made them choose that particular location for this yes. construction? Most of the monuments that are built in India are commemorative. Commemorative in the sense they are, for example, if it is Buddha, so they are related to the life events of Buddha. If it is the um, uh, Jain, so they are related to the Gurus, the Tirdankaras or the Bhikshus of the Jains. Or if it is in Hinduism, they are related uh, historically uh, let us say emergence of Shibalinga, uh, it is Kashi, okay, something like that. So basically, there is some or the other story related and there may be a uh, earlier a small structure was there and in due course of time, due to the royal patronage, these structures have grown into a uh, huge structures. There is a reason for every structure and location that have been chosen. And this is basically is called, uh, generally is called as Thala Puran. So wherever there is a place, it has got a history and based on that history, that place comes up. Uh, the third question will be moving on to sir is, um, is Gol Gumbas built on the basis of the stupa? Uh, basically, see, because there is a huge gap between a stupa and the Gumbas, at least not less than uh, 1500 years old. So we cannot say directly that uh, Gol Gumbas is inspired from stupa, but then Gol Gumbas is definitely inspired from the physics. 
uh, physicality in the sense you you want to uh, create so much space you can never do it with a flat roof but then when you are con constructing a dome you can create huge space so keeping that in mind because they always wanted to especially islamic architecture or islamic rulers they always have focused by because it was inherent in them that they all always wanted to evade or escape the heat that they have come from and especially uh, gol gumbas bijapur gulbarga etc are very hot places so for that reason they have uh, constructed and it is purely uh, situational and geographical the last question um, that i would like to ask you sir is how do we as students assist uh, tourists to identify an architectural style and help them get a better understanding uh, of heritage through heritage interpretation because we see that a lot of uh, tourist guides do not explain the architectural um, importance the styles elements so how do we as students assist tourists yeah so a uh, very beautiful question i'll take uh, uh, some 2 3 minutes to explain this uh, see uh, when we are visiting a monument so a guide comes to us and he has a recorded story to tell us he will switch on the button and he will switch off the button and in between what has happened we never understand now i met a tourist couple uh, who came to destination wedding in rajasthan once so uh, because of curiosity i was interacting with them and i asked a lot of questions they said Uh, you have a lot of questions but we are going from india with a lot of questions i say why what is the reason i said uh, there there is some uh, symbol 3 we don't understand what is it then i said it is called as om i said we have asked many but nobody explained us so these are all practicing hindus they have not explained us then he said these these are all practicing christians these are all practicing muslims they had a question with uh, the number 786 and uh, because that is the common number they find in autos taxis etc they asked many and nobody was ready to explain and nobody knew what 786 uh, uh, means so basically because of this lack of interpretation what happens is people do not understand the monuments and when you do not understand the monument you are not in love with it for example when you explain what that monument is now you start appreciating the art when you appreciate that itself 50% of heritage conservation is done you need not promote you need not create awareness because that is how no when you like a plant when you love a plant you water it you don't pluck it so that that is how the concept is so my request to everybody is there is lot of literature available for example if you talk about architecture during the colonial term there is there are people like percy brown james ferguson so if when it comes to temples from south india itself there is this uh, uh, acharya prasanna kumar acharya who has written wonderful books okay ta gopinath have written wonderful books you just have to start there is this beautiful book written by sp gupta called as elements of indian art you can just take that book and st start from there that is where i also have started and then you keep on digging the books literature okay and local literature is also available so the more you read the more monuments you understand and when you understand theoretically you go to the monument you click, click the pictures come to the home uh, take those pictures and understand each and every uh, uh, try to understand each and every element if you don't understand okay ask somebody question question yourself and try to find out what that element really means for example many people do not know there is a base to this taj mahal uh, uh, you almost it is uh, 10 to 12 feet high basement is there on that taj mahal is standing so now many people do not know what uh, what that base is called that base is called as chakka now what uh, where does this word chakka comes from this word uh, word chakka comes from chatushka the four corners and this chakka chauka is a common word even in the rural villages of uh, india whenever you are talking about a bed they all, they also call it as chauki chakka etc even the chair also they call it as chauki chakka so in the sense that is the seat to the taj and that is the reason it is called as chakka now when you explain this concept to the people they fall in love with the monument and whose job it is see now archaeology and history people they are not into tourism and that is the reason there is no chance for them to explain us and we tourism people are not into history and archaeology and that is the reason we don't understand then who will explain the tourists so as tourism professionals it is our job 
to get into history archaeology understand them and interpret them to the tourists because see you not even 1% of heritage interpretation is done in india till now and there is great scope you can earn for example when uh, foreigners are coming they are mostly interested in heritage interpretation but not in history and years so when you interpret them they have 100 questions and i i practically have taken many foreign tourists to the monuments in and around delhi jaipur uh, agra gwalior etc and they have hundreds and hundreds of questions and their questions never end why because they are curious tourists they are learning tourists and if you are not guiding and interpreting to a learning tourist then your tourism business is lost yes so we do have one last question <clears throat> So, what were the technology and tools used to build such grand architecture at that time? You will be surprised to know. Like, I do not know who asked that question. Everything was manual. No advanced technology was available. It is just by chisel and hammer, and then using weight lifting, physics, and physical techniques, they have built such structures. Structures, for example, when you are building a home today. we lay a scaffold of wood and ropes the same style of scaffolding was raised raised across the monuments and built physically by the people and now when you look at those structures you will feel that it is highly impossible to do so but our ancestors have done because they always worked in teams so when you work in team anything is possible for example i was talking about indus valley civilization you know every day 1 million if the cities of indus valley size are built in bricks so our historians have calculated and found out that 1 million people have to work every day then you will build such uh, cities in the sense imagine what kind of management will go in to control those 1 million people in the sense they were uh, okay doing a lot of homework blueprint homework was done by them for years together and that is how they have achieved all this thank you so much sir uh, for clearing out the doubts it's not joy that makes us grateful it is gratitude that makes us joyful good afternoon everyone i would like to start by thanking our chief patron and principal dr sister lalita thomas for her constant support and encouragement i express ex express my deepest gratitude on the behalf of the department of tourism and travel management to our resource person for today mr ramakrishna kongala for his enlightening and insightful words i would like to extend my gratitude to the vice principal the teaching and non teaching staff without whose help this program would remain incomplete i would like to convey my thanks to the technical team for their timely assistance I would also like to convey my gratitude to the organizing committee consisting of our HOD Dr Anila Thomas and the faculty of Department of Tourism and Travel Management Mr Prakasha N Dr Manisha Seal and Mr Atul Kumar Sharma for the constant support and guidance I would also like to thank the student coordinators for the effort and dedication they put into making this event a successful one I would like to thank and convey my gratitude to all the participants and guests who have joined us today for making this event a successful and memorable one. And finally, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to God Almighty for his grace, wisdom and divine guidance. Thank you everyone for attending this session. Participants please note that in order to attain the E certificates you will have to fill out the feedback uh, link that is provided in the chat box. Thank you everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you sir. Thank you so much.